Good evening, everyone, or good morning, whatever time it might be for you. It's evening for me. It's late afternoon for the guy who's the better looking guy who's next to me, who I'll introduce you to in a second. Um, but I'm glad that you're with us for another live with Kevin, the second one today, different purpose. Um, if you've been with me before and you've seen up in that corner that it's our podcast, that's obviously often what I'm doing here. This is a different kind of series. Uh, this session, as you probably know, is called If I Only Knew Then What I Think I Know Now. Um, longer title, 40 years of leading uh, from Purdue to today, because this gentleman that's with me and I went to school at Purdue together. And uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But here's the thing. Uh, earlier this year, we celebrated the start of the 30th year of our company's existence. And as a part of that, we decided to bring in some friends of ours and people that we know and that we that we trust and that we love to sort of hand the mic over to them. So while I've been on lots of podcasts, not usually on our platform, usually on our platform, I'm the one doing the interviewing. Um, but today the mic will switch over here in just a sec. And uh, so if you're here with us live, uh, thanks for being here. Please uh, say hello, what, whatever platform you're on, just use the comments. You know how to do that. Just say hello. Tell us where you're from. And if you happen to be from Purdue, and that would be like a bonus. Uh, you could tell us that as well. But man, we're just happy that you're here, whether you're here live or not. But if you are live, just say hello. And while you're here, if you have questions, ask them. You know, if you like if we were in a conversation around a, a table having a cup of coffee, um, if you had a question, you'd ask it. If you had a comment, you'd share it. If you had an idea, you'd offer it. So why not do that here as we go? So I, I'm going to. Um, just introduce this gentleman that's with me. Uh, we did go to school together at Purdue. We met in our senior year, I believe, or before our senior year. And um, and I don't know, in the in the line of questioning, some more of that might come up. But uh, he's a guy that I've always looked up to. Uh, I learned a lot from when we were in school, and I've learned a lot from mostly af afar uh, over the last mm, long period of time. <laughs> so uh, without any further ado, let me introduce to you Rusty Roof. He is a an executive, and an investor, a board member, a mentor, a philanthropist, a podcast host, a former radio personality, an author, a friend, and yes, a boilermaker. He has served on the President's Advisory Committee for the Arts for the Kennedy Center, was appointed by President Obama um, as the coordinating national co-chair for technology and has been on the executive team for innovators for President Biden. He serves on a variety of personal, excuse me, of corporate boards, he served as a CEO, as an HR EVP, and more. He holds an honorary doctorate from Hanover College, an MS in counseling, and a BA in radio and TV from Purdue. He and his wife are the named benefactors at Purdue for the Patty and Rusty Roof School of Design, Art, and Performance. He co-authored a book in 20, 20, 2006 titled A New Manifesto, excuse me, Talent Force, A New Manifesto for the human side of business, and just this year, a new book, The Faith Code, a future-proof framework for a life of meaning and impact. He writes regularly for his blog, Purposed Working, and is the co-host of the Faith Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. And as I said at the start, I'm going to hand the mic over to him, and uh, we're going to go wherever he says, because I have no idea exactly what we're going to talk about. He picked the topic, even. Um, Rusty, it's all yours, sir. Hey, Kevin, thanks so much for uh, letting me do this and, and letting me be here on your platform. Um, I really appreciate you and all you've done over the years. And as you like to say, you know, I'll turn it back around on you. You're remarkable. So it's fun to, for us to, uh, to be able to be here together. So this idea of, you know, boy, if we knew then or what we think we know then and what we think we know now, um, I thought what I'd do is I'd start with testing your memory and see... <laughs> Is I should have picked it. Who picked this guest? <laughs> That's right. Is there a leadership role at Purdue, as you think back over those years, that really, really stood out? That you would say, boy, that 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 role really helped define what how I think about leadership today. Well, I, I I'll start by saying that. Uh, that we met because we both had a lot of leadership role, roles on campus and and were in a, an honor society because of that. And so that's how we met. So it sort of makes sense, I guess, to start with that question. Um, I, along with a couple of other guys, created a, an organization and created a, what became a trade show for farmers that lasted about five years. And we raised a bunch of money uh, for scholarships. And so that 
probably. I mean, it, because because it enco encompassed not just uh, leading something that existed, right? But but creating something with the help of a t of building a team, creating a vision around that, making it happen, um, building a coalition around across the university to make it happen. Um, that would probably be the thing. I, I learned a lot. I also learned that that. Uh, keeping the vision alive beyond you in your role is hard. Like, so it was very successful until there was a real transition and then mm -hmm. not as much. And, 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 you know, I think maybe I'd do a better job of that now than I did then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm great, really happy that you use the word vision um, because vision not only is, is the idea that, you know, what's, what could happen in the future that you don't, actually see and at that age at that age you know delayed gratification and visions not that not normal normal at that age right for for most of us um but yet you saw something that you were looking back out there and looking at and saying hey you know what happens five years from now where did that come from you from in you was that just is that innate or or did you learn that from somebody else to say whatever I, I'm going to do. I need to. I need to look around the corner. I uh, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I I was I was blessed with parents that were very supportive and a father who was a farmer and an entrepreneur. So I'm guessing probably some of that uh, with and from dad. Um, he gave me a tremendous amount of responsibility at an early age to do stuff in the business and 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 have responsibilities. So I think probably some of that. Um, in many ways, we kind of grew up together because he was just he and mom were just 20 years older than me. So I was always with him, right? He was active in the community leadership at church and in the community and that sort of stuff. And, and like, I was always hanging out with him. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that I, there's probably some of those kinds of insights that I gained from listening to those kinds of conversations at a younger age than most would have the chance to do that. Yeah. I mean, we do know that, that um, we are very shaped by the dinner conversations when we're about 10 years old, right? And, and we, we're exposed to those things. Those are the things that many times we carry, um, which leads me into my next question. So one of the things that we know for sure that great leaders have is they have a strong set of values and principles. And as you think back 40 years, <laughs> 40 years to you, right? Man, that is just hard to even say, Rusty. It is, it is, it is. It's, 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 it's very hard. Um, can you think of, of experiences that you had then that helped shape values and principles, in particular, maybe, you know, ethics and integrity, because it's such an important part of being a great leader? Well, certainly, um, you know, growing up with, growing up going to church being in church and and all of that and so faith is clearly a, a major part of that uh, uh, certainly uh, a a piece of that uh, a big piece of that comes from mom and dad's example my grandparents example and all those sorts of things uh you know i i think that that's really that's really where it, it starts for me and i think for for many uh is those you said age 10 kinds of dinner table conversations. I, I'm taken back to that because uh, my sister, my my wife and I, my sister and my brother-in-law own the farm that we grew up on. And I sit at that table now. Um, and now it's funny because I sit rusty in dad's chair. I don't know why, but that's always the chair I'm sitting in. Um, and, uh, and trust me, it's still dad's chair. Um, but yeah, I, when I, when I'm at the farm alone, um, which happens quite often, um, I often reflect on those conversations uh, around that table and the the memories around that that table, and there's no doubt that that shaped uh, my thinking. It shaped my values. It shaped my beliefs, um, and, and I and I think it shaped my aspirations without question. Sure, sure. And I don't want to run past this point for the people who are listening and watching. Um, these conversations that we have when we come home to generations below us, kids or grandkids, how we talk about work, how we talk about our roles, make a big difference. It makes a big difference as, as you think about 
that conversation that they're listening to and you come home and you go, oh, my boss, I can't stand, I can't stand him. I, you know, I wish I was out. Of, what do you think they're taking away? They're taking away, boss is bad. Boss bad, bad. Mom, dad, they don't like the boss. Oh, so, there, there's so no we, doubt. We have, to, we have to think about that. I, I say this, Rusty, I say this in, in when I'm working with leaders all the time. I say, like, I have a whole little shtick about this, right? So, like, the first thing is, you know, they made a movie called Horrible Bosses. It was so good they made a sequel. They never made a movie called Awesome Boss. Right. No one would go. Now, yeah. because societally we have all this sort of in our head, um, the villain is often the business leader, right? Um, but beyond that, it is. It's the kitchen table. It's uh, what was the weekend like? You know, thank goodness it's Friday. It's five o'clock somewhere. Um uh, take this job and shove it. Now I'm, I'm taking you back to your radio days now, right? But you you follow me <laughs> that that all that's in our heads and and around the table is a huge piece of that. And so when I'm talking to leaders, I'm always my point is that when the title comes to us, all of that stuff is in people's heads, and it doesn't that's mean right. it it means number one, it's a low bar. Like if we're if we're decent, like pretty soon, like wow, they're not all that stuff. But it also means that we're starting at a deficit, right? right? With many people. But now to talk about it from your perspective, from what where you're bringing it to us to think about our responsibility as the adults and how we're talking about it with others, it's huge. And, yeah. and, and, you know, growing up on a farm, I really know what it means to work hard physically um, mm -hmm. and mentally. And, and so my view of work, I came to find out over time is not the same as everybody else's, right? So that that's, I mean, maybe there's something there we want to talk about, but, but it took me a while to figure out as an adult uh, that not everyone saw things the way I did. Not everyone came from a family where there really wasn't a boss. There was an entrepreneur, right? Um, and and those sorts of things. So that, that was, there was a lot of learning for me, you know, sort of in the years after we met um, in that regard. Right. You know, um, when we were back at Purdue, uh, we used to brag that we were the school where you had to, you had to work hard. That other school down the, down the, down the road, you know, in Southern Indiana, they didn't have to work yeah. as hard. And that school down know. south, I call it, that's where my daughter went. Oh, how'd you let that happen? I don't know. My, yeah, I, it's a really good question. Uh, so, um, so I think there was, there was some of that work ethic, right. That you could just, you know, you, you could work your way through it. And that was part of the, part of the ethos. And year, years later, Mitch Daniels, when he became president, right. He talked about grit, right. That, you know, he, he was so impressed with um, the grit that students from Purdue had. And, you know, I think that I think we did. I think we learned that back then. You know, I, I know I certainly share that. You know, you sometimes you just have to push through and you just just keep at keep at it. My dad used to say, put on your big boy pants and go to work. Yeah. Right? yeah. And yeah. so I have I have to tell you, I have three. You're the third of my three Purdue experiences today. So the guy that I interviewed for my podcast earlier today, I didn't even know it. Like his book is called Wiring the Winning Organization. His name is Gene. Kim, and I didn't even know it. It came up in the conversation that he went to Purdue. That was pretty awesome. And then this afternoon, I, I spoke at a class earlier in the semester, and I had a a student reach out to me on LinkedIn and wanted to ask me some questions. He said, let's just get on Zoom. So I had 20 minutes with with Ellie today and, and you know, was reconnecting to, a, well, she's a freshman, but she's really a sophomore uh, at Purdue. And and then knowing I was going to talk to you today is is kind of a nice little yeah, that's cool. trifecta. But I think you're right. And I saw that in her today in my conversation with her, that that's certainly the way I think she views the world, even though that wasn't necessarily our yeah. particular yeah. conversation. Yeah. So one of the other real core elements of being a great leader is, is the ability to resolve conflict and to, and you work your way through conflict management, conflict resolution. Do you remember conflict in positions that you might have had way back when? Remember, or like yesterday, or like what? I mean, no, um, <laughs> no, I, I will tell you that this is not my best thing. 
Mm. Right. Th this, this one's hard for me. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can navigate it. Uh, but when it's, when it's, uh, closer to me, um, it's harder for me. I mean, it's not, you know, it's one of the things that we, we wrote about in from Bud to boss and we, and we teach some, uh, it's not my, it's not my greatest gift or my top skill, but I, but I certainly, you know, you, you can't have been a leader and not have those things come up. And I think one of the lessons is that we, even if it's not our best thing, we can't, we can't assume it will go away because it won't like, That's it's right. going to get worse. You know, I mean, if people don't solve it themselves in sort of the everyday stuff, because that, you know, there is, there's conflict in sort of everyday working yeah. together. Um, if, if that doesn't happen, then at some point uh, we as leaders need to first, hopefully incur encourage the two parties to come to it together. If we just swoop in, we're not, we're not helping anybody really. Um, eventually we may have a role, but you know, I'm always reminded of, of the, uh, of the Hatfield and McCoy's feud, which was real, of course, for like a hundred years. And it all purportedly started. I've read about this multiple times with the, perhaps that one of the families stole a pig from the other family. Now, like if the patriarchs solve it, get together and fix it, we don't have a hundred years of conflict. Right. right. Like, I think the lesson I've learned is you, you, you gotta, you gotta deal with it sooner than later. Um, it's easier to deal with it sooner. And it's also far more productive for us to deal with it. Yeah. Sooner. yeah. Well, what, what's your take on that? Well, as I reflect back, um, I remember times where there were disagreements. Um, I remember, um, in particular when we were both on mortarboard together and there was a time we we're trying to figure out, the mortarboard calendar and what color it should be and oh. all this kind of stuff like that. And there was just this, you know, disagreements. Um, I, I feel like I came out on the right side of it because we chose, we chose that year gold and black and they never went back. Um, because and, and, and as, as you never should, let's just be clear. Right. Yeah, right. And, and, and they wondered why the red and white one didn't sell well from a couple of years earlier. So, um, but there were just disagreements about that. But what I, what I remember in that time is that um, we just moved past our disagreements much easier than we do today. Like today, it feels like in this world that we're in of uh, divisiveness and uh, polarization about all kinds of things, that we seem to hang on to a grudge longer or we hang on to a disagreement longer. And you know, I like I like to think about it this way. It's like what Thomas Jefferson said. Look, you know, it, we're, we're, our lives are like a stream. You know, there are rocks and boulders that you should that that are going to stay there, and those those you should absolutely stand on. But all the rest of it, it just water that's gone, and something else is going to come, and you just have to accept those things to come and go. And I I worry a, a little bit about today's college generation or up and coming generations where they're being taught by role model, by what my role models and what we, they see in society to hang on to a grudge or hang on to a disagreement and carry that into the next conversation or carry that into the next year or just carry that through life. Life's too short. Life's you too know, short. Man, I agree with that. It, it's interesting because, you know, there's, there's so much uh, effort and time and money being spent on things like diversity, inclusion, uh, equity, and inclusion. And, and nothing that I'm going to say it means that that isn't important. It is. And yet the other day, Rusty, I wrote about inclusion uh, for, a, for a magazine. And, and I said, you know, the things that we that we learned in kindergarten are the things that make inclusion work. Like we don't, it, it, right. folks, it's not that hard, right? play fair, share, say, please, thank you. And I'm sorry. Like if, if we will do those things, then the inclusion thing will, will largely melt away. Now I know I'm oversimplifying it a bit. And yet sometimes we have to go back to those core principles to remember that this isn't, this isn't some overly difficult philosophical challenge what it is is for us to go back to looking at each other like 
other humans. Like when you showed up in kindergarten, you didn't think about anything except, hey, these are new people for me to meet. And if we will do that in life, we're far better off as opposed to retreating to our corners, to our echo chambers, um, to our safe zones and all those other sorts of things that we probably don't want to talk about. That's right. Well, and and by the way, the precursor to diversity and equality is inclusion. If you, you, if that's not, niche, if that one's first, you don't have to worry about the other two near as much. It's, exactly, exactly. So it's funny you bring that up because I, I asked Chat GPT the other day. I said, "Give me a question about leadership that I'm going to ask a college buddy from 40 years ago that would not have been asked back then." And what came up was diversity, equity, and inclusion that we wouldn't have been talking about that 40 years ago, um, even though we might have intuitively known it was important. Um, But I I wanna go there for just a second because you've seen businesses and and management teams come together. And and if you reflect back on the teams that we had, I mean, one of the great things about you and I when we were on mortarboard and doing that is because it was very diverse, right? I mean, it it was very much so. It was very diverse. And we didn't manufacture that. It just it just came together. I, and and I, I know for a fact, because we created the, the group that came after us, we didn't sit around and talk about ratios or quotas or anything. It, it came because we had this attitude of, you know, it, it's good. It's good. Let's get the best people. Let's put it together. How, how has your thinking changed over the years as you've watched management teams? The pros, cons, the competitive advantage that might be there because of diversity on a team. Well, I I think that's definitely true. The competitive advantage, right? Like the, one of the things that I would say I'm, one of the things that I'm proudest of about our team is while we may not be diverse uh, in, in some ways, like by some measures of diversity, my team is not that diverse, but by measures of, of uh, thinking process, communication style, behavioral style, we are extraordinarily so. And in fact, I've got a whole team of people very different than me. And I'm proud of that because it creates a more effective team. It creates a more vibrant team. It creates the chance for us to be more successful. And, And I think that leaders at all levels, including senior management teams, that value finding uh, divergent voices will almost always win. Uh, The leaders that look to find people like them or that want to be the smartest person in the room or those sorts of things seldom win for for any length of time because, you know, when we can, when we can put together a richer, deeper, more vibrant group, it, it's going to it's gonna be better in every way. Frustrating at times, perhaps, that's a learning process for us. I mean, that's a learning process for me as a leader, and that's a learning process for all of us. It, it, it's one of the things that I coach other leaders on all the time. So um, what have I learned about this? You know, I, I grew up in a small town, uh, farming community, by every measure that we think when we think about diverse diversity now, like non-diverse, right. 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 Show up at Purdue, very diverse. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think, I don't think I ever really thought about it very much. Like I, I, I I'd like to hope that I kind of was like that kindergartner, like, okay, yeah. here's who's around. Um, yeah. And, and I would like to hope that that's true. Maybe others that knew me then or know me now would, would, would give me, a different feedback. Uh, but Rusty, I, I really think that when we just treat each other like humans, we will include others. Like treat others the way you want to be treated. I know we're going back to first principles here. Like, hello. And, and if right. we do that, uh, we're going to solve a lot of this pretty quickly. Yeah. You know what I, what I wish I would have done at, at Purdue that I didn't do is I wish I would have taken advantage of that diversity. Of, of all of the different countries and ethnicities yep. and people who came from different parts of, you know, the, the United States who came from different, you know, mindsets and experiences because 
it is the, and we should tell this to all of our kids and grandkids as well, it is the most diverse place that you will have in the rest of your career and life. Because as soon as we get out of college, you know, we end up, we end up in a, a functional area inside of a company. So we decide, oh, we're, we're in finance. So we end up in finance. So we hang out with all the finance people. You know, we might, we might even find our partner or our spouse in, in, in the finance function inside of an industry, inside of a town. And we may or may, or may not move. And the next thing you know, we don't, we don't know anybody yeah. from yeah. Nigeria. But yet it's that person from Nigeria or Malaysia you know, sat next to us in that class and we never looked over and said, so tell me about where you're from. Can yeah, I, maybe we I said hello, to, we exchanged the pleasantries, yeah, but we didn't right. do that. Like I didn't. No, no I'm, not as no, much as I should have. Could have. If, if I if, if I could go back and rewind, you know, rewind the, the tape, I would I would have picked out, you know, 25 people and I would have said those 25 people, I want to know. The, the greatest place inside of your country that I should visit someday. I want to know the food. Can, can I, can you cook me the food that you eat? So I, so I can experience that. Can you teach me some of the words in your language so that I can carry that with me forever? Um, but I didn't, Yeah. but we should, but we no should, doubt, you know? no doubt. But that's right. Should. Yeah. Agreed. So um, shifting gears just a little bit, but I want to, I want to get into uh, some personal reflection. What have you learned about failure? <laughs> um, failure is necessary. It's part of the human condition. And um, when we remember to treat it that way, it can be a launching pad. Now, because we're humans, we don't always remember that. Um as a leader, sometimes that's embarrassing and that can be hard because we, we feel like the, the mistakes of the team are, the, are on us and all that. And so th there's that piece. Uh, and, as a, and as a competitive person, which I am, uh, it is hard sometimes. I think I'm way better at it than I used to be. I, I think that when we remember that as humans, we're going to make mistakes and that we should learn from them. Someone asked me recently, Rusty, what do I regret? And, and there's certainly a lot of things in my life that I would go back and do differently. We just talked about one of those things, right? But I don't think about them as regrets as much as, okay, what, what did I learn there? So I hopefully don't do it the next time. Yeah. Do you remember having mentors in college oh yeah lots of them um uh so several different professors uh i, I talked about this uh this student organization this this what we call the ag expo that we created so you know we had to enlist we had to enlist professors to be involved because there's stuff we couldn't literally get done without help but we enlisted them in that and and a couple of those people became lifelong mentors for me, not just during that time, but beyond. Uh, I, I'm pretty confident that we could both name a couple of people with the same name uh, that we would have cons would consider mentors as well. Uh, so I had I had mentors in in school, both uh, in the faculty as well as on the staff. Uh, I had mentors at that time in my life um, in, in, in my hometown, uh, again, colleagues of peers of my father that that I would um, certainly say were mentors. And I had I had peers that I that I, you know, I would include you as one of those people that I you know the, while we didn't know each other until our senior year, um, I I observed you. We had a, we had conversations about obviously about right. stuff related to mortar board or this or that. Right. But but yes, I, a large list of people. And are there a couple of attributes from those mentors that you've carried over to try to become a mentor yourself? Well, I would like to hope that there are people that would say that about me. And I think that there are a couple of things that I learned from many of those people that I just mentioned. One of them, and maybe the most important, is to be present. To just be present. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes what 
we need from others is is feedback to you know to show us our blind spots and all that that's all certainly true but sometimes all we need is someone that will be there with us for us um all of us have had the experience rusty of of someone coming to us and they're and they're they've got an issue they got a thing and they get they jabber 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 and they go on for three four five six ten minutes and then when they're done they say thank you and you're like i didn't do anything but you did you let yeah. them process out loud which helped them come to a conclusion and you were mentoring them in that moment without saying a word. And I, I think that uh, the best mentors among many attributes must be present. I work on that. I, I work on that all the time, not always very successfully, but I, I, I do consciously work on being better at that. Yeah. You know, as we get to be our age, there, <laughs> there, there, there are things that people will go through that there are no words for. Right, they're going to go through an illness. They're going to go through a loss, um, and as hard as it is, just to be present, to sit in the room, without words, means something. It means something, and uh, it's a great it's a great lesson, Kevin, for all of us to to take forward. Um, you know, for you know, sure. as now, let me just take that to leadership just for a sec, because oftentimes. We, we got promoted into roles that say leader um, because we were, because we were subject matter experts, because we knew the stuff, because we could get stuff done because we figured stuff out. And so as leaders, sometimes we're afraid of not knowing the answer. Yep. We feel like people think we're supposed to have the answer. We put pressure on ourselves to have the answer. But what I often say to people, Rusty is, as leaders, remember that people want our ears more than our ideas and our attention more than our advice. Right. Right. It's good. Really good. All right. So I'm going to ask you the, um, you know, the question you probably thought I was going to ask you, um, and we can either keep on going or we can wrap at this point. So, so, so hard for me to come up with, with this one. So what do you, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? <laughs> Uh, well, lots, I suppose. Um, and yet, you know, life unfolds the way it's supposed to. And so I, I guess I could say, well, there's all these things. So, yeah, I wish I knew that. I, you know, I, I wish that I would have, um, done an even better job. Although I think it did a pretty decent job of networking. I, th there are certainly people from school that I wish I had stayed in closer contact with, uh, yeah, I could make that long list, but I think the more valuable thing is to say, how do we take where we were as fodder for our future rather than sort of saying, oh man, I wish I knew that. Yeah, like, like I I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, both of us, when we were in school, were probably told we were pretty good public speakers, right? right? Listen, I had the good fortune to speak at commencement. So did I. You, I thought, you, I, I couldn't remember for sure. We were in different yeah. sections. Exactly. We both spoke at our freaking commencement. Yep. Right. Same here. That's right. And, right. and, you know, people said nice things. I'm sure to you, I'm, they did to me and all that stuff. Uh, and, and if I, I'm sure that if I, I wish I could see it, well, maybe I'm not so sure that I wish I could see it, but I wish I could see it. And then, and then I think about, you know, early in my, in my career in, as a trainer and as a speaker, you know, uh, again, lots of feedback, doing really well, all that stuff. There's that. And then there's, you know, like 10 years ago, and then there's now. And I, I think that if, when we look back at that, we'd say, oh my gosh, could have been so much better. Yeah. And, and yet, the the challenge is for us to to know that we're going to continue to get better uh and it and it is those moments that allow us to be on that path to get to where we are today so i guess i i'm not really answering your question but it's the best answer i got no it's very good it's very good you know we were really lucky too we didn't get in too much trouble when we were at purdue we could have 
we could have. And you know, I was there were there were some times when you know a, a little change. Yeah, and I uh, I was reflecting on this. It said there are there are times to take risk and there are times to not take risk. And and there were times when you and I were leaders that had we gotten in trouble, it would have really reflected poorly on the organization. And I remember one time um, at Waterboard, uh, we actually did get a little in trouble where we spent. Uh, I think we did some things that we probably shouldn't have done for the Mormon. And I got called in by Dean Cook and said, you know, do you realize the stain that could have come on our organization? And, and then she turned it around even further and said to me, and the stain on my reputation. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's a great life lesson, a great life lesson. So, you know, I think, I think on the other hand, a lot of fun. I had a lot, have a lot of fun. On the other hand, we were among the very first people to write on the wall at Harry's. And let's we just were. be clear. We were. We were that day. That day. And that was March 16th, 1984. Yes, because it ended on St. Patrick's Day. And do you realize, do you realize that that date is coming up? 40 years is coming up this March. So um, I still have my T-shirt. I think I can still fit in it. I think we, we need to go back. We need to go okay. Back. I, I don't think I have my T-shirt, and I know I wouldn't fit in it. So... <laughs> Uh, you know, so. that's just one more thing to be to 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 uh, you know to to look up to you for that you could do that because I, I could not. Um, but yeah, that was that was quite a day. And I'll tell you what, I have I have had the chance to share that parts of that story with people. You remember the president had lunch with us? Oh yeah, absolutely. President I, I think it was you and I and him at the table, as I recall. It was, actually, it was. It might, um, it might have been Tim Street might have been there too. That could Tim be. Street or, or Mark Schrack, one of them. But uh, yeah, yep. we were there. He came to see us. Came to see us. I, I, you know, I reflect back on that, and and I and I think about you know those leadership th- roles that we were so fortunate to be in, and how they, you know, I don't think the, other, the, the we didn't take it for granted. I mean, it was like we knew that these were these were really important, and really we were blessed to be there, and. Um, you know, that was a great one of the, my lessons, too, is, you know, any leadership you have, never take it for granted. There's somebody else who would just would give anything, anything to have it. And we've been given it. And when we've been given it or we've earned it, uh, we must do the most for it. We have a responsibility for that. So, oh, uh, it's, you know, being a leader uh, is is a big responsibility for sure. All sorts of reasons. Yeah. But it's also a huge opportunity, right? And and when we remember the two of those together, I, I think we set ourselves up to be intentional in ways that make us better at it. Right. That's right. That's right. So that's what I had for you today. I don't did, any, did, did we not talk about anything that you wanted to talk about? No, no like I, I came into this, like I handed you the mic, man. <laughs> But, you know, now I, go, I turn it back to you. I mean, it's your show. So, you know, if you want, if there was something that you wanted to get out, get it out now. No, you know, I, w- when we conceived to do these shows, everybody, uh, I, I, I knew that I wanted to, to bring people on that, 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 that they would, they would take this, take us where we went. And so wherever we went was the right place to go. I had no expectation other than that you and I would have a good time and that hopefully there'll be something that someone sees and hears, uh, and, and finds value in it. Um, so uh, hopefully for all of you that are watching or listening now or later, that um, you're not just l- looking at the, the memory lane of Rusty and Kevin, but rather uh, can take some value from our conversation and can hopefully then do what I always encourage people to do is to say, now what, what am I going to do as a result? So it's my hope that, that uh, as you hopefully enjoyed this half as much as we did, that you you take from it something to say, hey, that's going to help me be a more effective leader. That's going to help me be a more effective parent um, and, and maybe help me bounce back from a mistake or a failure as well. So, Rusty, thanks so much for joining me on uh, your Monday, one of your three heavy work days. Uh, I'm even more honored that you included this in that. And um, and uh, 30, 30 years of an organization doesn't come around that often for people. So, you know, you, you're, as I said at the beginning, you're remarkable. This is fantastic. And it's been my pleasure and honor to be here. 
with that, everybody, we will say good night and I wish you all a great week. And I hope that you'll come back and join me for another Live with Kevin sometime in the future. Thanks, everybody.